All right, so I just got back from photographing Brazil for the last six weeks. And during my stay, I was choosing to shoot on this Fujifilm X-A5, which is a six-year-old camera over my Sony A7 IV, which got me thinking about the topic of what actually makes a good photography camera. As I feel image quality in particular hasn't had a major improvement compared to things like lenses and autofocus. For example, the X106 was just released yesterday and there isn't any major improvements in terms of photography if you're coming from the previous model, the X100V. Yes, you do get a bump in resolution and they've added IBIS, but that aside, it's basically just the same camera. So in today's video, I'll be showing some photo examples of my time in Brazil while I explain the five main factors to consider when buying or upgrading a camera. So let's just jump right into it. first and obvious factor to consider is image quality but there's a big difference between image quality and quality images meaning that an experienced photographer can capture a good photo pretty much on any camera in the right conditions there's a few things to look for in terms of image quality when buying or upgrading a camera and the first thing to look for is does it have a mechanical shutter a mechanical shutter gives you an instant readout as it is a mechanical curtain coming directly in front of the sensor while an electronic shutter reads from the top to the bottom of the sensor resulting in what's called a rolling shutter now this rolling shutter can give you a bit of a jello effect when you have any motion in your photo and you can get a flicker or banding when you're using artificial lighting now you can definitely make an electronic shutter work but a mechanical shutter is definitely the preference especially when you have fast motion in your shot if you're using a flash and if you're using artificial lighting. Now, sensor size is where a lot of inexperienced photographers get quite confused. You know, full frame sensors have more dynamic range and they have more detail. There's no denying that. That's especially true for medium format as you can just keep zooming and zooming and zooming into that really detailed and impressive RAW file. But after you've edited your really impressive 16-bit RAW file, and then you've exported it into a compressed 8-bit JPEG file, ask yourself this question, where is this image going to be used? A majority of us are using these images for online use. So for online use, an APS-C or even a Micro Four Thirds has plenty of detail to work with, even for printing large prints like the one behind me. If you like the way that I edit my photos and you want to emulate that film look, Make sure you check out my presets, which are linked down below. Now, a good photography camera must be able to shoot RAW. RAW files give you the most dynamic range and flexibility in post for editing and changing your RAW white balance. And that's what separates this older Sony CyberShot camera that I was testing out while in Brazil. It doesn't have any RAW capabilities. It does have a mechanical shutter. It's got a fantastic Carl Zeiss lens in there. But unfortunately, you can't actually shoot RAW, so that just downgrades all of the image quality that you could potentially take on this camera. Now, unfortunately, this camera also has a funny SD card slot and a very funny cable, so I couldn't actually take these example photos off the camera. And I wouldn't actually recommend this camera, even though it's super affordable. I do actually have a few recommendations at the end of this video that are at a similar price, so make sure you stick to the end. So over the last 10 years, auto focus has been the biggest improvement we have seen a slight bump in dynamic range and more accurate color science a good example of this is a video i did with mitch i was shooting on the dslr 5d mark 3 
which is now 12 years old while mid shot on the newer and modern mirrorless Sony a7 IV. And the main difference between these two cameras was not only the size and weight, it was the autofocus. There was also a slight difference in terms of dynamic range and accurate color science. So cameras from even 12 years ago actually have quite similar image quality to modern mirrorless cameras today. If you wanna check out Mitch's video, I've left a link in the description down below. The next consideration that makes a good photography camera is the lens options and the cost. And when I bought my first camera, I laughed at the fact of how much a good lens was gonna cost me. And the main reason I don't use mirrorless Canon cameras is because the lack of RF lens options with no cheaper third party support. Third party options like Samyang, Tamron, Viltra, Rokinon provide fantastic lens options at a fraction of the price of native lenses. And as you go from micro four thirds to APS-C up to full frame, not only does the lens actually get a lot bigger, but also the price increases as well. You can go out and buy the best camera in the world right now, but you need a good lens to actually complement that camera. And I feel that Fuji and Sony not only have really great native lens options, but they also have fantastic third party support. Build quality. My biggest concern when I was using this Fujifilm X-A5 while I was in Brazil was the lack of weather sealing. While this Fujifilm 27mm f2.8 WR lens is weather sealed, unfortunately the body is not. And when I bought my first photography camera, I didn't even think about how resistant the camera and the lens would be protected from dust and moisture. I also didn't consider how long of a life the shutter is rated for, and I actually do have a bit of a sour taste in my mouth from Sony, as last year I had two Sony a7IV's shutter fail before 200,000 shutter acquisitions. While cameras like the Canon R5, the Fujifilm X-T5, have a shutter life around 500,000, which is more than double of the a7IV. Also having IBIS within the camera, so having a stabilized sensor will allow you to shoot handheld photos at slower shutter speeds, resulting in sharper photos. And lastly, how comfortable is the camera to hold and how big is the overall setup? That's pretty much the main reason why I use this Fujifilm over my full frame Sony camera, as I can pretty much just take it wherever I want and I'm not worried when I'm bringing it out. While when I go out with my Sony, you know, I have to bring like a full bag and a full setup to keep it nice and safe because it is quite a bulky and heavy setup. So there's no point going out and buying a big impressive camera and lens combination if it's just going to restrict you from going out and taking photos. As a modern day photographer, we are dabbling more and more into video work. Video is definitely a great way to diversify your income and improve your skill set. Photography specs have really plateaued in cameras and every year there's not that much of a jump. But we're starting to see some really impressive video specs jumping into cameras and camera manufacturers are really pushing this to sell more cameras. And the video specs that matter to me is I look for a 10-bit log profile, being able to shoot in 4K 60 frames per second, have good stabilization, have decent rolling shutter performance, and have good and reliable autofocus like I get out of my Sony cameras. And finally, my last point is, what's your budget? And not only the cost of the camera, but the cost of a lens, a spare battery, SD cards, or a bag or a sling to protect the camera. And these are definitely extra costs that I didn't even consider when I bought my first camera. And Casey Neistat a few years ago had a really great example of this, of how image quality goes way up from say a $100 camera to a $600 camera. But from 600 to 6,000, you only get a small increase in image quality while a massive increase in price. Now, if you go from 600 to 6,000, the price goes way up and the quality only moves a little bit. As you spend more, you get less and less for your return. And there's some great secondhand options under $1,000, like this Fujifilm X-A5 
You can pick it up on eBay for around $500. The lens that I've been using, the 27 millimeter f2.8 is around $400. If you can find one, because they're currently out of stock everywhere, you can buy a Canon 5D Mark III for about 600 bucks. And for under $100, you can pick up a lens. So there's a big difference between image quality and quality images. And don't rely on an amazing camera with amazing on paper specs to produce amazing photos. If you like the photos from Brazil, make sure you subscribe because next week we'll be talking about my favorite focal length that I've been using everywhere, especially in Brazil, and that's the 40 millimeter.